I really think trainees who want to do this has to like it. They have to like people from other cultures. Um, it's not enough to respect other cultures. You have to really like it. You have to enjoy people who are different. You have to uh, understand and celebrate what they bring to the world, and bring to life and bring to us. Talking a little bit about what inspired me for the uh, Intercultural Psychiatric Program. There are kind of uh, several influences. Um, the, certainly Vietnam as a civilian doctor was a huge influence. We saw many, many sick people. We saw the war. We saw people killed on both sides of our house. Saw a lot of wounded people. Very sick people. A lot of uh, children with dehydration. Uh, rabies and eclampsia, typhoid fever, things that actually the antibiotics worked in those days, so that was the good side of it. In those days, we had a rotating internship, and I was in Oakland, California, which was pretty good preparation because it was a, almost a war zone, too. Um, but one, one week I was in Oakland as an intern, next week I was in this hospital. There's two, doc, two American doctors and two American, American and Canadian doctors and two American nurses. And we had Vietnamese interpreters. And so I was part of the team running a medical ward, a TB ward, and uh, pediatrics. Uh, and they were very sick. Uh, we lost, I lost six kids in one week because I had just hadn't had any experience of, of hydration, uh, diarrhea. And then once I learned to do IVs and cut downs, and I, uh, we saved most of them. But we lost a lot. Uh, from just illnesses, and we lost a lot from gunshot wounds and things that we couldn't save. So it, it was personally traumatic. Uh, the one thing that why it really helps, I think, psychiatrist is that you lose some, you can't stop. There's more out. You have to get up next day and go back to work. Uh, and that kind of gives the idea of keep going on and handling defeat, as it were, and, and keep going. So that was, that was a, a major, I guess, experience that uh, doctors now don't have. Uh -huh. a after we got pulled out, I would work then, I was sent as part of the same organization, CARE, to uh, the Aborigine Hospital in Malaysia. And the P Peninsula of Malaya has, uh, is populated on the outside, but the jungle areas had about something like 14,000 Aboriginal groups speaking different languages. And the, it was run, it was organized and run by a very, very good British doctor, Malcolm Bolton, and I was there for the, the 16 months or so. Uh, he organized this by getting people from the local tribes, bright young people, training them to be um, kind of um, uh, uh, paramedics, um, medics people, and and so that's where I got the idea for this clinic. Getting people from the local community to be counselors and case managers. And it worked very, very well. We had a, a hospital of 200 people with two doctors, but they weren't all very sick. Uh, and everybody came with their family. We caught them all as patients. So it was interesting. They, one of us was in the hospital for two weeks and then in the jungles for two weeks. And so we went back and forth, and I had the southern part of the Malaya Peninsula, and we had the Malayan Air Force take us around to places, or we went by river uh, and hiking in Land Rover. Uh, it, the, the value of that was that the Aborigines are afraid and, and very low-key, and you have to be very cautious and very um, gentle. In your approach, and often it's kind of interesting. You go into a village and they'd see you, a white person, with it, my counselor there, my aide, and they'd get quiet. And so you'd sit down and just say, "We're from the hospital," and they knew about the hospital. And anybody sick here? And they'd say, no. And the men would come around and sit around, and then someone would light up a cigarette and pass it around. So we all took a smoke, and then pretty soon an old man would come out and he said he might be sick. So we would examine him, and later I learned that's the head man, and he would, de he would determine whether we could work or not. 
and after we saw him and everything calmed down, the line formed, and we had lots of people, and who, people, kids and women, very sick, waiting in their huts for the go ahead. So it, it that kind of gentle patience uh, was a very very good lesson. And don't push it. Don't hurry it. Uh, and so that that was a very very good lesson. A lot of very sick people, but uh, I, I'm, I I actually liked it a lot. Saigon fell in 1975, and we started getting refugees um, soon after that. Uh, and Oregon took quite a few refugees. Uh, and at that time, the medical school was giving us free time. I had two afternoons a week for research, and, and at the same time. Well, first of all, I felt very guilty about what happened in Vietnam. I thought we, we t treated things terribly, and so part of this was out of guilt. There was a, a grant for us, the community to have counselors, train them to do counseling. Well, the, a lot of people they saw were psychotic or severely ill, and so I spent one afternoon, uh, and they'd bring patients up. and. And so I'd see them, and they would kind of follow through. Uh, at, and for a long time, uh, we didn't get paid. It was just volunteer work. The, well, then they lost their funding uh, for these people. By that time, we had about 60 patients uh, of Vietnamese, Cambodian, and, and Lao, uh, and Mian. And uh, so we spoke to the mental health division and to the, for the Department of Psychiatry and got three or four counselors, maybe even more, uh, onto the Department of Psychiatry payroll. So they were working in the Department of Psychiatry, and at the same time, I had a Vietnamese resident who was a surgeon in Vietnam, and, and he was becoming a psychiatrist. So my idea was that he would run this Vietnamese clinic for four years, he would finish, I would do something else. He'd take the patients. Well, he finished, but the patients didn't go with him. <laughs> they stayed with um, me and the counselors. And by that time, we also had Cambodians and, and Lao. Uh, and uh, soon then, uh, the two, our two main colleagues, uh, Paul Young and Jim Bainline, had finished residency and were working in this uh, program too. And so the three of us have worked for over 30 years together. Uh, our counselor, my main counselor, Cambodian counselor, worked with me for 35 years, I think. Um, and so we have a large number of staff who have been here 10 or 15 years. Uh, and that the stability of the program uh, has been amazing and, and, and kept it going. You have to remember, we didn't have a PTSD diagnosis to 1980. So we didn't know they were traumatized. <laughs> that, that was quite uh, re revealing, and we, we all thought they were depressed. And then we got the Cambodians, and they kept told these horrible, horrible stories, really terrible. Uh, and I was giving talks, and someone about 1980 or 81 said, do you see PTSD? I said, no, no, they're just depression. And I went home and thought about it. Well, why don't we see PTSD? So I and a resident, Dick Fredrickson, made up a PTSD scale just out of the symptom checklist and we decided to give it to the next people. The next people we saw, 12 Cambodians, all had severe PTSD. We didn't know it. I think our report was one of the first non-Western uh, PTSD reports. And so th that's how we got interested in it. Uh, Cambodians really did it. Eventually we went back and interviewed uh, Vietnamese and Lao, and we had missed PTSD many times uh, because we didn't ask the right questions. Uh, now over half of our patients in the clinic have PTSD and other things too. But the, uh, having the counselors from the community really made the relationship. And when we had, and almost all our counselors, we chose them incidentally on their personal qualities not on their, any of their knowledge. Most of them didn't have any uh, graduate training. Warm, gentle, people, people who pe the people would go to and, and talk to. Say, who in the community do you, 
you just have a question you want to talk to. These are most of the people they picked. Uh, so those, and they were our ambassadors uh, to the community, much more than um, imams or ministers or, uh, or Buddhist priests. We, we did have some of those contacts, but our own counselors by far the ambassadors, and that worked uh, about very well. The, uh, the biggest challenges was believing that uh, PTSD exists. <laughs> we didn't believe it for a long time. And also believing it's a chronic illness. Because we, we were starting to treat people um, briefly. We thought that six weeks, like, and maybe a little longer with antidepressant medicine, they'd get over that, and they didn't. Uh, and we were frustrated because they should get better, they didn't get any better. They are frustrated with us. Uh, until we begin to get some experience that severe trauma and PTSD with some psychosis, some depression, is a chronic illness. Then, and that was an insight for us. And then we, we backed off this need to hurry and, and get people well. And, take our time, slow things down, be accepting that there's going to be ups and downs, exacerbations and remissions. And that made a huge difference in our comfort level and their comfort level too. We thought it'd be over in uh, five years or something like that. We didn't know then that there would keep beating, being uh, traumas, genocide, torture throughout the world. And we didn't know they'd come as refugees or asylum seekers. And so it just kind of developed uh, when, uh, as more and more refugees have come and asylum seekers now are coming. Uh, uh, we would, we've adopted, we've accepted it, that that's part of our job. But we, we never planned for it. And we never planned it'd be this big. We, we added children. We didn't expect that we'd have seen many children. Now we have a child clinic, part of this. Um, the other, I guess, the other one really good thing is that we are we've helped our counselors um, get graduate degrees. I think about half our counselors now have MSWs, uh, and the program has supported that. Uh, and so that that's been a, a good addition. I really think trainees who want to do this has to like it. They have to like people from other cultures. Um, it's not enough to respect other cultures. You have to really like it. You have to enjoy people who are different. You have to um, understand and celebrate what they bring to the world and bring to life and bring to us. Uh, that's it. You also have to believe that things are very bad, that there are really evil evil things in the world that happen to people by other human beings. And I think you have to believe that you can help. Uh, that y you, our medical training and our personalities can make a difference in people's lives. And that's worthwhile. That, that's worthwhile doing.